This morning we are in week six of our love series, More, more Than Words. Love is, is more than words, more than a sentiment that is expressed. And the obvious truth that we've been seeing each week and we really highlighted last week is um, love is a big deal to God, okay? That's probably the understatement of the year. It is the big deal to God. Um, the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of these, after listing faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these, number one for God is love. And so if you're going to live a successful human life, that will not be measured, uh, according to God, primarily in how much money you make and how many achievements you accrue and how much stature you gain and how many people admire you and how talented you are. The scoreboard is love, is love, according to God. And so we talked about that obvious truth from Scripture last week. Now, a lot of folks I would say, or you could think, you know, what's the big deal about Christianity? I mean, I think if you were to go and just kind of poll folks from, from Buddhism or Judaism or Islam or any major world religion, they would probably all agree love is a big deal in my religion. Right? Love is a big deal in pretty much any major world religion. Love is idealized. Love is held to be a, a very important thing. So what's the big deal about, about our faith? How is it different? What's so special about Christianity? Well, for starters, what's different is what Jesus said about love. Luke 6, 27. He said something very different. I tell you who are near me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. So what Jesus said is pretty, you're not going to find anything like that, okay? In the writings, the sacred writings of any world religion, but it's not just what, what Jesus said, is it? It's, it's how Jesus Lived. He didn't just talk about loving your enemies. When he died on the cross, he was giving his life for the same people who put him there, right? And while he is breathing some of his last breaths on the cross, one of the final things that he ever said was, God, Father, forgive them. Jesus didn't just talk about love, didn't just talk about loving his enemies. Jesus lived it. He is the one unique juncture in millennia of human history where talk about loving your enemies and the practice of loving your enemies converge in this one life, the life of Jesus Christ. So yeah, yeah. A lot of world religions talk about, about love, teach love, encourage people to be loving Jesus. Jesus was different, very different. Now, you know, you don't, need, you don't need a religion to love. You don't need a religion to love the lovable. You don't even need God to love the lovable. Um, that stuff comes natural to us. It's normal for us to love that which is winsome and attractive and admirable and lovable. Then Jesus comes along and says, love your enemies. Now, that's different. Now, that's different. Nothing natural, nothing normal, nothing instinctual about that. We're not, going to, we're not going to pull that off on our own. We're not going to love our enemies on our own. Someone has betrayed you. Someone has hurt you. Someone has taken that which is precious away from you. You, you need God. To love that person. You need God. Some folks hurt us or offend us accidentally. Those are not our enemies. Our enemies do so intentionally. They are opposed. They are out to get us. They are out to undermine us. Jesus says, love them. Love them. Honestly, we won't be able to do that. We cannot do that unless God gets involved. Only a divine interruption in these very normal and natural cycles of hate and violence 
and bigotry, only a divine interruption in those cycles can do that. Write these two things down this morning as we get started, kind of framing our conversation this morning about one of the hardest, probably the hardest teachings of Jesus. If, we're gonna level, if I'm going to level with you this morning, the hardest teaching, love your enemies. Two things here. The normal way that people deal with those who have wronged them, even the score, even the score. It's what usually happens. That's what pretty much every action film is based on that you would buy tickets to and see at the cinema. Someone is evening the score. They lost someone, they lost something, and they're out to get revenge. And that's how they're going to make things right. Well, as disciples of Christ, we're called to interrupt cycles of hate and anger with love. That's what we're called to do. Now, confession as we kind of set this up this week, this is certainly a text uh, or several texts we're looking at this morning that I wrestled with this week, um, thought very seriously about working through this series on love more than words without talking about loving your enemies because, I mean, there is so much teaching in the New Testament that is eminently practical and helpful. I mean, you'll get all sorts of tips and advice and counsel and commands from the New Testament that will really bless your marriage, that will really take your friendships to the next level, that will really enrich and deepen and, and cause your relationships to last longer and be stronger. Very, very practical, practical stuff, right? I mean, I love teaching that stuff because I know it's going to connect with people. I know they're going to have a point of need in their life, and they're going to go, yeah, that really helps. I mean, last week, the five love languages, a very, very helpful stuff and biblically-based stuff makes an impact on our lives immediately. And so I wrestled with, with this this morning, and the idea, could, could we not just do a series on love without talking about loving our enemies? I wrestled with it because that's not practical. Okay, well, I'll just level with you. Not, not practical. Um, but here we are, followers of Christ. And Christ taught us to love our enemies. And so my promise to you this morning is we're going to be very impractical today. Very impractical. Um, now, what you do with this message is between you and the Lord. So, who do you hate? Who do you hate? What person or, or, or what group or, or what political party or, or what n- nation? What, what do you hate the most? And, and I know, I know, a lot of people are going, well, I don't hate anybody. I don't hate anyone. I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a believer. Okay. All right, um, I, get that, uh, I, I get that we don't want to think that we hate anybody, so let's put it this way. Who do you like the least? Who do you like the least? Um, we don't want to think that we hate anybody. I get that. Now, I'm not sure how honest maybe we're being with ourselves, but, um, but who do you like the least, or, or who do you fear the most That's a pretty good place to get started on on who your enemy is, who you like the least, who do you fear the most. And just for clarity, let's differentiate between like and love. Very different things, right? Liking and, and loving are very different. Liking is an involuntary response. The food you like, the movies you enjoy. Um, the kind of car you like to drive, the people you like, those are involuntary responses. You don't really decide, I'm going to like that kind of car. I'm going to like that person. You don't decide who you like. That comes naturally. That comes automatically. And to be clear, the Bible never commands you to like your enemies. Okay, It doesn't. In fact, God never commands you to like anybody, for that matter. You cannot. You can not like 
your enemies. That's impossible. Forget trying to like them. That is not what Jesus calls us to do. Jesus calls us to love our enemies. Liking is involuntary. Loving is a decision of the will. Loving is a decision you make. The power to love someone you don't like, the power to love an enemy, that comes from the Lord. That comes from the Lord. That comes from what God has already done for me, for you. That comes from what God is doing in me, in us, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That comes, that comes from the Lord. He's the source of this kind of love. Because it's not involuntary to be sure. It's not normal. It's not natural. Not instinctual to love your enemy. From a small country town, there's a story of a mom who took her little boy to the, to the market, to the country store there. And when she was finished shopping and checking out, the old shopkeeper, this elderly, kind gentleman, pulled out this big jar of, of jelly beans and said to the young boy, he said, why don't you just grab yourself a handful of jelly beans? And the boy was kind of coy and kind of shy and didn't budge. And after a few seconds, that shopkeeper reached his hand in and pulled out a handful of jelly beans and dropped them in that grocery bag for the boy. And the boy said, thank you. And when they got outside, the mom said, look, I know you and I know that jelly beans are your very favorite candy. So what's the deal? Why didn't you put your hand in that jar of jelly beans like the man asked you to do? And the boy said, his hand is bigger. <laughs> His hand is bigger. Um, I'm called by God to love my enemies. That's clear to me. But I can only love my enemies if God is involved because His heart is bigger. His heart is, is bigger than mine. Let's pray. God, a simple prayer, a humble prayer this morning. You have called us through your son, Jesus Christ, to do something that looks very impractical, very difficult, kind of seems to us almost impossible. And we ask you this morning to let your love pour through us, to let your heart beat in us. We call on you because you are bigger and stronger and more generous. Love through us. In the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. So our only option essentially is to lean into God's grace and into his power. No excuses. No excuses. We can love our enemies. God is not going to call us something that we will not be able to do. I don't know if you remember this a couple years back. It was Easter Sunday. I had my friend Brigitte who is a Rwandan. She was at that point a student at Oklahoma Christian. Rajit and I had a conversation on Easter morning, and she shared some of her story, a very, um, very sad and tragic story, really, as her family was swept up in the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. I don't know how many of you remember her. Um, but Brigitte shared her story, shared how her family was decimated, her parents murdered, Family members murdered, friends murdered. Somehow she survived in the Rwandan genocide. She eventually, through an uncle, through his teaching and his lifestyle, came to know Jesus, gave her life to Jesus Christ. Now she's in graduate, actually, I think she's finished graduate school in, in the U.S., but what she shared with us this morning is that she forgave her enemies because of Christ because of Christ and she lives in freedom and she lives in joy because of the resources that Jesus poured over her because of the cross and as I thought about that and, and thought about this morning what we're talking about um 
you know, if she, if Brigitte, can forgive her enemies by the power of Christ, I know that we can. I know that we can. And so we're going to walk through some practical steps, better yet, impractical steps this morning uh, about interrupting cycles of, of hate, interrupting cycles of, of, of conflict, and truly loving our enemies. And as we do this, we will see every step of the way Christ is right in the middle of that. Now, first, I can move toward loving my enemies by thinking, we don't start by thinking about them and thinking about what they've done. We start by thinking about how Jesus interrupted our cycle of hostility with God. Right? So write that down. Number one, ponder, meditate on, digest how Jesus broke the cycle of conflict between you and God. Right? How Jesus interrupted that. Romans chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Paul writes these words. Our, think about this phrase, our friendship with God. Wow. Our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son while we were still His enemies. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Now, I see good in a lot of different philosophies, in a lot of different religions. I really do. I see good in those. I, I see God in some different philosophies and in some different religions. I see pieces of God himself in there. I really do. Jesus, however, gives us a singular link to God because only Jesus, only Jesus gave up his life to end hostilities between you and God, to pay your debt of rebellion, your debt of sin against God. Only Jesus restored your friendship with God. And while we were sinners, while we were sinners, while we didn't know the Lord, while we didn't care at all about His agenda, while we were lost, right then, Right then, where we were sinful and separated from God, Jesus died on the cross to make things right, to reconcile us to our Creator. Did Jesus wait? According to Paul, did Jesus wait for us to get our act together? Did Jesus wait for us to deserve the love of God? He went ahead, and in spite of us, he gave his life for us. Now, Paul says, because of Jesus, we have been made friends with God. And so every, every Sunday, as we celebrate communion together, as we break the bread, which represents the body of Jesus that was broken on the cross for us, as we drink the wine that, that symbolizes the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us, we ponder that. We do this in remembrance, don't we? We meditate on it. We are amazed by it. We stand in awe of it. And that's where loving your enemies starts and ends. It, it's right there at the cross. It's a love that is not conditioned on the worthiness of your enemy. It is not conditioned on the goodness or the likability of the other. It begins and ends with the cross, where Jesus loved you 
and gave up his life for you, undeserving, rebellious, sinful you. So, if I am going to love my enemy, then I have to live in the shadow of the cross with my knees quaking in awe and reverence for what God did for me, for how Jesus loved me when I was his enemy. Number two. So that frames everything right there, the beginning and the end, cross. Number two. Practice treating the other as you would be treated, as you would like to be treated. Um, Jesus famously said in Matthew 7, 12, So in everything you do, uh, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. How important is that teaching, which is known as the golden rule? How important, Jesus said, for this sums up the law and the prophets. You want a good summary of the entire Old Testament? Love others the way you'd like to be loved. Treat them the way you would like to be treated. Um, That pretty much sums it up, Jesus says. And what an amazing concept. (laughs) What a powerful concept. Imagine a Ferguson, Missouri. Imagine a Waco, Texas. Imagine a Baltimore, Maryland. Imagine a Dallas where folks treated others the way they wished others would treat them. Instead of the normal way of doing things, right? Instead of the let's even the score with our enemies, instead of dealing with those who aren't in our group or on our side of an issue or a debate point, instead of of looking to get even with those who aren't like us, imagine treating them with respect and with honor and with the charity that we would like to be treated with. Dare I say that would be heaven on earth. We're almost very close to heaven on earth. And well, we, uh, we are God's people, God's kingdom people, redeemed by the cross. And when we love our enemies, when we treat them with respect and with charity and with kindness, we are showing the world a glimpse of what heaven looks like. It's what we're doing. We're giving the world a taste of this reality that will be the eternal reality. Number three, pardon the other of past and present offenses. Forgive. Paul says it this way in Colossians 3, verse 3. 13. Forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. And again, remember the reference point is Christ. Paul says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's how we forgive. So check that out. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. He pardoned my every sin. He has given me second chance after second chance. He has been gracious and forgiving with me day after day. And now the Bible says, hey, treat others with that kind of attitude. Here's what it looks like. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, which we've been kind of using as a reference each week during the series, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians, well, verse 5 says this, Love is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. That, I think, is what it looks like to love like Jesus loves me. I'm not looking to even the score. I'm not even keeping score because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. 
Number four, perform an act of kindness towards them. Perform an act or acts of kindness toward them. Luke 6, 27, Jesus said, Do good, remember, do good to those who hate you. And you may not want to do this. You may not feel like doing this. Correction, let's just be honest. Let's concede the point here. You won't want to do this. (laughs) You're not going to want to do this. You're not going to feel like doing this. Like being kind to someone who's been a total jerk to you or who has hurt you and is still hurting you. You are not going to feel like doing that. And if you're waiting on your feelings, right? God, give me the right feelings here. If you're waiting on your feelings to kind of propel you into serving your enemy, you're going to be waiting a long time. So you won't want to perform an act of kindness, but do it anyway. Do it anyway. Don't respond according to your nature, but according to your new nature. Your divine nature in Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. Jesus did. And when he died on the cross, he knew that not everyone would believe on his name. Not everyone would accept his death on the cross for them. Not everyone Jesus knew was going to thank him or praise him or live for him. His kindness was not conditioned on getting something back. His response wasn't conditioned on their response. Okay. So check out what Jesus said. Let's, let's read this one together from Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45. Let's, let's read this one out loud together. Jesus said, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be called sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We've been blessed this spring with a lot of rain. So has God given this blessing of rain only to the good people, only to his buddies, Has God given, is rain falling only on the yards of people in Dallas, Texas, the yards of those who go to church on Sunday morning? Did you catch that logic there? Jesus, this divine logic that Jesus uses, we are to love our enemies, we are to work for their good, because we, because we are children of the Father. Okay? We are children of the Father in heaven, and our Father causes the rain to fall on the righteous people and the unrighteous people. He gives the gift of rain and sunshine and a billion other things to the good people and to the bad people. To those who love Him and those who hate Him, He blesses, Jesus says. And we are to be... This is the logic here. We're kind of to be chips off the old block. Children of the Father. It's His nature that we partake in and that we live out when we do good even to our enemies. Acts of kindness. Number five, persistently pray on behalf of others. As opposed to pray on your enemies, pray for your enemies. Jesus said... Matthew 5, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, again, ship off the old block. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. Intercede on their behalf. God, bless their marriage. God, bless their children. God, bless their endeavors. God, show them your love. God, draw them to your bosom. Part of loving your enemies, according to Jesus, is to get on your knees and pray for them. Finally, number six. This is a good bookend. As we started with Jesus and we finished by turning back to Jesus. Number six, persevere 
because of who you are in Christ, not because of who they are or because of how they act. And I love this verse because it's short and it just nails it. John in 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because, put a circle around that, we love because he first loved us. Because. Again, the because, the beginning and the end of loving your enemy is Jesus. How he loved you. How he treats you. Normally, people love because the other person is lovable. Normally, we love because the other person can, can do something for us, helpful to us. Or we love because they're attractive or because that other person over there, she is a great gal. Normally, we love because... We admire, or we're drawn to, or we love because of our own self-interest. We think they can help us out. But we love because He first loved us. Amen? That's why we love. Paul puts it this way. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 16. Paul says, Christ's love, talking to disciples here, talking to believers, Christ's love controls us. I think the NIV says compels us. Either one, it's pulling the levers. It's moving. It's in the driver's seat. Christ's love controls us. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. We have stopped Evaluating others from a human point of view. Evaluating from a human point of view, that's what we see every day in the world around us because that's the way the world works. Evaluating from a human point of view, I love you because you're really nice. I love you because you can really help me. I love you because I'm attracted to you. That's a human point of view. Evaluating someone's lovability. The lovability index. Okay, You're scoring high enough, I'm going to love you, right? A worldly love is always... What's the word Paul used? A worldly love is always evaluating. It's always, a worldly love is always looking for an angle. Looking out for number one. And so you can be sure with a worldly love, there are always strings attached. But Christ's love controls us, compels us, moves us. And that makes the difference. Because guess what? His heart is bigger than my heart. His heart is bigger than your heart. He is more generous than me. He is more forgiving than me. He is more loving than me. And when we choose Jesus as our Lord, when we become his disciples, then we are moved by his expansive, big-hearted love and not by our pettiness. So here we are, a Jesus calling. A Jesus calling that is both impractical and inconvenient and incredibly beautiful. A Jesus calling that if you're, looking, if you're thinking today, I, I see that in the Bible, Gordon, I, I, I get the points there, everyone, Jesus said all of that stuff, but that's not going to work. No, it's not. I mean, it, let's, let's, let's say 99% chance this is not going to work for you. Right. If by that you mean going to somehow help you out, make your life more comfortable, more convenient, it, it's going to, it will work for the kingdom. It will work to bring glory to the Lord. Full disclosure, it is unlikely to work for you. 
Jesus' expansive love sent him to the cross. The expansive, beautiful love of Paul for his enemies got him stoned and arrested, and so on and so on. It will work for the glory of Jesus Christ, but it will not be practical, and it will not be convenient. So this morning, it may be that you need prayers about that, about someone or some group that you need for God to, as Paul said, take control. You need for God's hand to shower love in that situation because your fist is clenched. Pray about that. We know what God's will is. And when we pray with faith according to what we know God's will is, He answers. Pray about that this morning. Get together with your wife or your small group or whoever's sitting next to you on the pew. Pray about that person. Pray about that situation. Pray about that group. Maybe this morning you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. He died for you in all of your unworthiness, in all of your sin. Jesus died because he loves you. However you need to respond this morning, we ask you to do that as together we stand and worship.